Dr. Kelly gave you a lot of the facts about the conference that are super exciting. And I get to pause for a moment and talk to you about a kind of full circle moment when it comes to introducing our keynote speaker. Life has some of these full circle moments. I mean, because an exciting thing to say is that Janice Ray, she teaches us and reminds us of the importance of and our connection to place, community, and the planet, right? And that's kind of how you would generally introduce. But you're here, many of the students, with your research mentors. So a full circle moment for me was, this is our first book, an older version of it, right? Because my undergraduate mentor greeted me one day and said, here, you need to read this. Because he thought I would relate to Janice's story and it would encourage me. Because this first book of hers talked about where she was from, right? And so it talked about that place on a very narrow scale, home, right? And she grew up in rural Georgia. I grew up in rural Florida. Florida's a bit more than beaches. There is a rural Florida. One of my favorite pastimes, I would sit in the sand by or under my trailer catching doodle bugs. Okay, so needless to say, grew up way out in the country, trailer, you know, was not very familiar with navigating a college environment or understanding how I could accomplish some dreams. And so I thought it was kind of neat that Janice is leading a workshop a little bit later in the day called Writing Your Own Story. And I'm very grateful she wrote hers. And so with that, I'd love to turn the stage over to Janice Ray. The sidewalk was crowded the evening the Kingfisher fell. People stopped staring at the ground, then up, bewildered. It just dropped from the sky, a woman said. Above, Chittenden Bank rose shining, four stories high. Windows are sky, dusky sky, the river meters away. Kingfisher, I know their chants by heart. I've watched hundreds dive, rise, fly off, but once I held a Kingfisher in my hands. I touched that blue power. It might be the only time I ever would. What I held was more precious than handfuls of money. If I could have thrown it to the wind to restore it, I would have. What to do with such wild pain was the question and the answer. Carry it across Elliott Street to the bushes by the church, to the flowers, and slip it inside an envelope of green. Give it back. Give it back, all of it, and go home. Thank you so much for having me here at uh, University of South Carolina Upstate. I've, I've had a really wonderful connection with Dr. Pilgrim and um, this semester I'm teaching at Hollins University in Roanoke. I live in Southern Georgia still. And so um, anytime I get to come south, I feel like th this is home too. Um, I want to welcome everybody and it, it's a wonderful thing for me to be able to stand before you on this gorgeous spring morning in the Piedmont of South Carolina, uh, in the watershed of the fabulous Lawson's Fork Creek where textile mills once colored the waters, and running into the Pakalit River in the place that Catawba Indians once called home. I'm honored to be invited to be part of this conference. Uh, it's so, the 14th annual, so well organized, so smart, so useful, so forward thinking. I want to um, talk to you about a little bit first about where I come from because of who you are and why you're here. Um, and read a tiny piece out of the book that Dr. Pilgrim held up. A junkyard wasn't a bad place to grow up. It was weird enough to stoke any kid's curiosity, a playground of endless possibility. Since my two brothers and I were doorstep kids, which is what you call siblings born right after the other, the three of us made a pact. We talked a pack. We taught school to each other alongside a 50 Nash, the bluish green color of a chalkboard, using stubs of chalk filched from school to write sums on the car body, wiping them away with a rag eraser. 
Letters got scribbled across the sides, across door hand handles, skipping the crack where the door closed, ending at windshields. When my brothers would not have the patience to pretend school after enduring it all week, I lined my dolls on the ground and taught them. The junkyard was stuffed with junked, wrecked, rusted, burned, and outmoded automobiles and parts of automobiles. Ragweed and dog fennel sort of hid the mess from the road, but when you turned off the highway, you got the full effect. It was like sticking your head in a wide-angle trash can. Between car bodies were swales of scrap, bathtubs, motors, an airplane wing, the bucket to a crane, sparrow nests, froze up treadle, sewing machines, kids swimming pools going to crumbs, rusted harrows, more motors, a small mountain range of bald tires and rims, hubcaps, a gaggle of bent, broken, mutilated, unusable bike frames. Daddy collected hills of aluminum cans out of dumpsters and off roadsides because he intended to roof the house with aluminum shingles one day and went so far as to invent a machine that would slice off the top and bottom and split the cans down the middle to make a curling square. 10 acres of failed machines. In summer, we would skim along the flanks of these piles, wearing shoes for once, gathering fat blackberries that grew healthy in the mineral-rich loam, their canes mulched with scrap iron. The blackberries were luxuriant. We couldn't get our fill. Away from home, we were ashamed of the junkyard. Our daddy was a junk dealer, but when we filled out forms from school, we wrote salesman. We, my family, wasn't allowed to socialize outside of school, so classmates didn't come home with us, and we didn't go to other kids' houses. The junkyard then was all we knew. We knew nobody else lived like we did, but we didn't know how they lived. We knew they were wasteful, and they threw perfectly good things in the garbage, which ended up at our house. We thought that meant they were better than we were. The only time as a child I was not ashamed of where I came from was when a friend from school showed up with her dad looking for lug nuts or a condenser, or the time pole vaulters came from my sister's school to tear foam from out of old seats to land on, or when the spirit club at the high school needed tires for a bonfire, or when we paraded our metropolitan through rabbles of townspeople in the homecoming procession. Then I had something to offer. It didn't take many years to realize I was a southerner, a slow, dumb, redneck hick, a hayseed, inbred and racist, come from poverty, condemned to poverty, descendant of Oglethorpe's debtor prisoners, descendant of people who pulled from the Union, fought their own patria, and lost. When I was in sixth grade, my family took one of its only vacations to Philadelphia for a church convention. We stuck our pinkies in the cool crack of the Liberty Bell, wishing to hear it peal. We tramped wide-eyed through the open-air market, blocks and blocks of tangerines, chicken feet, fresh bread, pineapples. Glued together, we stared at kids playing in gushing fire hydrants on city summer afternoons, remembering our pond and feeling sorry for them. One day, while shopping for sandwich makings in a neighborhood market, people started crowding us, crowding close. Daddy turned to the produce clerk, who wore a blue apron. What's going on, he asked, askance. They want to hear your accent, the clerk said. I was with one of my brothers by the cooler when we realized some of the kids had advanced and stood a few feet away. We looked back at them. Say something, they giggled. Why, one of us asked. We want to hear you talk. Dell and I tried to think of something to say. What do you want us to say? He finally asked. They set to giggling. Why do you talk funny? Why do you talk funny? Dale shot back. When I went off to college, I struggled bitterly to lose my identity with the junkyard and my southernness starting with the accent. Away from Baxley, no one knew my past and I could accelerate my native tongue and desert its vernacular until I was free, or thought I was. I was the second person on both sides of my family to attend college. The first was my sister. 
I have a master's degree, which is more than anyone, even now, on both sides of my family have. After many years away, I returned to South Georgia to live on an organic farm. We have been in a dangerous trend in this country in terms of education. Education is underfunded and subverted by terrible policies like No Child Left Behind, which leaves so many children behind, and by ideas like charter schools instead of early childhood interventions, and standardized testing, which does not encourage dialogue and thinking. I believe that education is not an industry. Its proper use is, to ser is not to serve industry. You are not in the business of job training here, nor in the business of soldier making. Wendell Berry, the thinker, said, education's proper use is to enable citizens to live lives that are economically, politically, socially, and culturally responsible. A proper education enables young people to put their lives in order, which means knowing what things are more important than other things, it means putting important things first. An educated electorate is absolutely essential when it comes to our democracy, governance by the people, one person, one vote, not one dollar, one vote. If the people don't know what to think, how can they decide? And I believe that some political factions would have us all undereducated so that we don't speak up. This is why we, have, we continue to elect leaders who do not have our best interests at heart. Recently, I finished an essay, um, the, Lonely Europe, the Lonely Ruralist, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, present day, the present day rural, and um, obviously, we have been replacing small farms with large farms and taking away people from rural America. As the people disappear, so do jobs. As they disappear, so does the level of education. The few people that are left are farther apart. Those of like interests are more dispersed. But the problem isn't only that we're taking the people away. We are battering human community in many ways. And often in the rural, the resources to avoid or recover from these batterings are absent. Are absent. A father's mind pocked with holes, a brother's alcoholism, a neighbor's trauma, a buddy's opioid addiction, a friend's illness, a town's racism, a region's storm, a landscape's industrialization. In another important way, we batter human community, community. we de-intellectualize it. As the body seeps, seeks companionship, so does the mind. A hundred years ago, when the educated class was better educated, and when more of us stayed where we were born, one could experience in the countryside incredibly erudite people, people of arts and letters, talented people engaging in culture and civilization. Intellectualism, especially rural intellectualism, which is what I, uh, I'm immersed in, was alive and well. And I, I, I want to pause for a brief anecdote. Uh, many years ago, I was catching a plane. This is before I actually stopped flying. I have not been on an airplane in 10 years because of the climate crisis. So I take the train. Uh, I drive. We have a Prius. Um, I walk, I take my bike, I have horses. Um, I was standing on the tarmac in Greenville, South Carolina, and behind me was a gentleman reading a book that had no book cover on it. It was just, you know, he'd taken the cover off. And I just make it, as we were waiting to get on the plane, I asked him what he was reading, and he said, it, it's called Spice. It's a history of the spice trade. I long for the days when around you people are reading books, able to converse about all kinds of subjects. Now rural America is being scrubbed of imagination and idea. Where I live, most people have one foot firmly planted in the church and the other in the tea party, which usually means they've found everything they need. They get what news they obtain from the most conservative sources. Most don't have a college education, 
some not even a high school diploma. A town 20 miles from the farm holds an annual Sweet Onion Festival. Last year, my family went to watch the Saturday morning parade. Shriners came through in go-karts dressed like hillbillies, spitting tobacco juice on the fly. The, marching, the high school marching band moved languidly past, missing notes flying off like startled sparrows. The mayor pasted a, a little sign on the side of his car and he rode waving. A bunch of churches filled hay trailers with overweight kids. Later at home, I tried to remember one cultured, far-thinking, progressive part of the parade. What had we learned? What had spoken to our values? What had made us proud? We should have entered a library float, my husband mourned. Anything, I said, even a sign that, said, that read, read a book, it makes you smarter. Yes, the pastoral is often beautiful and nostalgic, but that's not the only thing it is. It is also depopulated, made depauperate, debased, destroyed, and most tragically of all, dulled and dimmed. In the stupefying rural, we have been replacing real, live, interesting, clever people with ghosts. But the de-intellectualization is nothing compared to the anti-intellectualization, where we make fun of young people who dare get an education, too big for their britches, and book sense but no horse sense, where we make it cool to be ignorant with billboards like, around here it's y'all state. Understand this, nowadays there is no common sense without book sense. So I live in rural America as a thinking person, as a reader of books, as an artist, as an educated person. I live in rural America as an inclusive person who upholds the rights of all races, all religions, all nationalities, all genders, all abilities. I live in rural America not buying the party line not accepting what I'm told, not doing as I'm told, thinking for myself, doing my own research, getting a second opinion, getting a third opinion, searching Google. I live in rural America as an environmentalist, dirt hugger, I mean tree hugger, dirt worshiper, <laughs> dirt hugger. I probably have done a little of that too. We have been living under a few false beliefs that we have unlimited natural resources, that we have the right, even the obligation to use them up, that now is more important than any other point on the geologic timeline, that pleasure is the purpose of our existence, uh, and that science will save us. We have come to the end of our belief uh, that science is going to save us because we are now facing prob problems that science cannot address. What to do about rising rates of cancer? What about the link of autism as well as so many other diseases to environmental toxins? What about the link of, what about declining species? Endangered species, migratory songbirds, what about frogs? What about birds of prey? What about the climate catastrophe? Over the years I've seen from the air and from the ground more and more fragmentation of our world. Um, fragmentation of the natural world means more roads, more fields. It means taking a large area of wildland where species are abundant where humans have more resources and dividing it, subdividing it, subdividing it. More telephone lines, more uh, suburbs, more bridges, more, let's see what else I have, resorts, more malls, um, wider roads, more pavement. The world is a globe of leaf green continents amid five blue green oceans land we knife into smaller and smaller scraps. Communities of life which for epochs have fit together in this clockwork pattern of rib and muscle, stalk and blade are being rent asunder. Pollution fragments, climate change fragments, species decline, 
Frag fragments. I'm forced to think about fragmentation because I come from a place where 99% of the native ecosystem is gone. And that's what I wrote about in the first book. Uh, Longleaf pine. In 1995, the ecologist Reed Noss was traveling around the United States for the National Biological Service looking at endangered ecosystems. And he found that by 95, 99% of longleaf pine was gone. An apocalyptic loss replaced by pine plantations, clear cuts, big box stores, suburbs. It threw an entire suite of especially adapted plants and animals into population decline. Animals like the gopher tortoise, the indigo snake, the red cockaded woodpecker, Bachman sparrow. What thrills me most about longleaf forests is how the pine trees sing. Horizontal limbs of flattened crowns hold the wind as if they're vessels, singing bowls, and air stirs in them like a whistling kettle. I lie in thick grasses covered with sun and listen to the music made here. This music cannot be heard anywhere else on the earth. Russell, whisper, whinny, aria, chorus, ballad, lullaby. In the choirs of the original groves, the music must have resounded for hundreds of miles in a single note of rise and fall, lift and wane, and stirred the hearts of the red cock cockaded woodpeckers nesting in these trees where I also nest. Now we strain to hear that music. Anachronous, it has an edge. It falters, a great tongue chopped in pieces. What we've learned from conservation ecology is that ecosystem fragmentation, dividing and dividing, affects the persistence and abundance and health of wild species. But I've also learned that fragmentation of the environment is mirrored in human society. So that as we chop up ecosystems, we damage structures of cooperative human existence. So on a practical level, this means the marginalization of people, dysfunction, brokenness. It means um, neighbors not knowing each other, more and more divorced uh, couples, um, more foster children, um, as with wild species, fragmentation in human society leads to isolation. That's loneliness, which is the place of hopelessness and despair. We know community then, well, let me go on. The worst part of fragmentation is that it leads to annihilation. War is fragmentation between countries. Fragmentation is the Iraqi man who lost 10 members of his family in the 2003 attack. There is a wire photograph in which he's circling from one coffin to another saying goodbye. Fragmentation is 34 elders left behind in the rising floodwaters of Katrina. It's three Muslim American students killed in Chapel Hill. So when habitat is lost, species disappear, when human community is lost, we disappear. We lose each other. We know community then, community, wild community and human community to be a place of hope, of wholeness, of possibility. I wrote a book called Pinhook, the Okefenokee Swamp in southern Georgia. Um, is now connected ecologically to uh, the Osceola National Forest in North Florida. 450,000 acres now of a contiguous wildland. Most people haven't heard about it. It's O to O, Okefenokee to Osceola. Um, the piece in between was Pinhook Swamp, which the Nature Conservancy began buying. And the last piece of the puzzle has been put back in place. Uh, a beautiful story, a place where we can restore the Florida panther, um, hooping cranes. We can restore ourselves. If we can create places like O2O and step away in the dominating sense of the word, then we can begin to enter a new epoch in, in, in this world, which I do not think is the Anthropocene, which is um, the human-centered epoch. 
I believe the Anthropocene is a dead end and I think it represents hopelessness. The most essential challenge before us in the 21st century is to figure out how we're going to live dis so that we don't destroy ourselves, our communities, our children. One in 20 children has autism. One in four children are sexually abused by the time they turn 18. That's a crisis. Our atmosphere and how to repair and restore what has been damaged. How are we going to lead lives that make sense? How will we return ourselves to wholeness? I believe through the work of restoration, re restoring our families, our communities, uh, wild places, the climate, we could elevate the dignity of being human. We can use our American traditions, these wonderful, unique traditions of courage, frugality, open-mindedness, belief in freedom, resistance to injustice, and willingness to serve humanity instead of our own, own desires to frame a new vision for a sustainable world. We can use our language and our resources and our minds in the highest and best ways to repair the fabric of life both human and wild. The new era is the ecozoic, I believe. I write about this extensively in a new book uh, about seeds. Can we bring back the red wolf? Can we stop drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge? Can we restore the Everglades? Can we protect the last roadless areas? Can we stop fracking? Can we stop mountaintop removal, blowing the tops off the oldest mountains in the world? Every day, you and I should be weighing even the most minute decision and asking ourselves, what action causes the least harm to others? Should I travel these miles? Should I buy this bottled water? Will my gains in knowledge and inspiration offset my damage to the planet? Are we committed to making change? Are we part of being change? Or are we just talking about change? Do we consider every decision we make? Do we analyze our own impacts and work to decrease them day by day? Do we continually strive to get by with less? Or are we living safely, properly? Are we unwilling to give up our memberships? Are we unwilling to look at our privileges? Are we unwilling to look different, to act different, to stand behind our beliefs, even if we might be considered eccentric or losers by the dominant culture? Are we granting ourselves exemptions? We have to believe with our bodies that what we know in our minds to be true. We have to accept the solutions to our problems as personal and start applying them personally and then all around us because living a lie destroys your spirit. It's a kind of mental illness, a schizophrenia. It also undermines your credibility. I know I'm preaching, and I'm not preaching a life of deprivation here. I'm <coughs> talking about bringing our actions into better alignment with our aspirations. I want to see our communities get more and more localized with more local food produced and consumed, more local goods bought and sold. I want to see local entrepreneurship and local music and local craftsmanship. I want a, a renaissance of the hands so that we use fewer electrical gadgets and motorized tools. I want a renaissance of the mind. Um, I, I wrote a really long speech, and I'm going to skip this next section uh, for the sake of time and to give ourselves a little more time for questions. But I want to just tell you what it's about. I used to think that if we could just, you know, s pass enough policy, save enough white, like making the cutting of an old growth tree, not just immoral, but illegal. You won't, you won't just get sent to hell, you'll get sent to jail for it. <laughs> I'm sorry to be so crazily adamant. In fact, well, I'll stop there. 
pass enough policy, protect enough wild places, educate enough young people, and we would stem the hemorrhaging of wild things from the planet. But I don't think that's true anymore. I think the base cause of environmental destruction is our economic system, which is, in, which is uh, industrial capitalism held in place by militarism. And so then you have, to, you have to, I invite you to start researching industrial capitalism. Look what it's doing. We are sacrificing into this global free market the things that matter the most to us. Our children, our prairies, our rivers, our farms, our farmers, our parents' minds, and on and on and on. Um, so you, the answer, I mean, you ask, well, what's the answer? Because we're all swept up, and, and I have a lot of, of answers. I, I, I write a lot about this, about the things that we could do. But, um, you know, short of sort of like a revolutionary upheaval in our economic system, I think the easiest thing to do is to bring yourself back and back, uh, retract from the global market back into local markets. And that's why we bought our farm in southern Georgia. Um, we grow food there. We, we have animals. We make a lot of our own goods. So let me just go, let me just quickly, I think you're going to have to get yourselves out of debt. It's a very difficult thing to do because most of us who want to get a PhD are going to be deeply in debt when we're done. But debt is a terrible thing because it forces you to conform in order to keep your job. So figure out a way, we've got to figure out a way that we can run our, our, our universities and that we can get educations at these universities without burying our children in debt. Debt that will plague them for the rest of their lives, the rest of your life. So remember that when you're signing on the paper. If there's any way that you cannot take the loan, I'm telling you, don't take the loan. The second thing is I, I really believe in moving toward right livelihood, what you were put by uh, the creator or your belief, your belief system to do. What, what is your divine livelihood? So that you're not working jobs that drain you and make you unhappy, but that you're doing your life's work, your heart's work. Um, I would rather be poor doing my heart's work than be the wealthiest person in the world, hurt, damaging life. Um, I think we need to move toward each other, uh, move toward conservation, sustainability, reduce, reuse, recycle, repair. Um, I think we need to buy local, try not to shop at chain stores, uh, give your money to your friends and not your enemies. We could talk a long time about this. It doesn't mean just, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shop at the, I'm going to buy a cup of coffee at the local coffee shop instead of Starbucks. It means making a dollar circulate as many times as possible in your local community. So you, Noah, need a birthday cake for your child. Well, you know that Kaylee um, makes cakes. She buys her eggs from Sue. Are you understanding? She buys her milk uh, from Tom. Are you guys understanding? So you want it to, you want your dollar to rotate. You want to give your money to your friends, not your enemies. Um, move toward renewable energy. Work toward population control and reduce your wants. Tom Powers, a uh, economist at the University of Montana, says that 11% of what we manufacture meets real needs. The rest is desire. So that means you're going to have to reduce the number of advertisements that you and your family see. Not long ago, somebody asked me how I stay hopeful, if I stay hopeful. How do I find hope? Do I have hope? I've been asked a, a hundred times. It's hope that enables us to live. Only hope, uh, wrote E.O. Wilson, the great biologist and ecologist. He says that our brains churn out narratives to make sense of life. Uh, using scenarios from the past, the present, and the future. Real scenarios and imagined scenarios. So narratives, our own narratives projected into the future are the same as the ones from the past with one difference. They are all imaginary. In the future, we find what is most distinctive about the human mind, he said, while creating overall other species. 
while creating scenarios for the future, the mind also manufactures options, conceivable consequences, and whole new venues for narratives itself. Everything in life depends on how well the future is conceived. We are the future-seeking species. And I thought, when I was recently asked about hope, hope? We do need hope. But do we really need hope to keep going? You know, we, we say hopelessness is despair. We have a, a crisis of depression in this country. People who can't get out of bed, they are, who are hopeless. But I don't believe in hope. I, I, I think, do you feed your daughter because you have hope she'll turn out okay? You find out she has asthma, so you quit feeding her? We don't do what we do because of hope. Are y'all getting this? We do what we do because of love. We do the right thing because of love. So the question, are you hopeful? How do you stay hopeful? Is, is inane. The real question is, are you full of love? How do you stay love-filled? And that's an easy one. How do you do it? You keep the words care and compassion in your heart all the time. Here, here's how I do it. I wake up every morning looking out at that big old fat orange sun every morning rising over the pecan orchard. And I listen to the, to the great crested flycatcher calling in the pear tree. And I look at the face of my daughter, my adopted daughter, who went through so much trauma. Gandhi said, more is required of you than simply being swept along so you have an obligation first to vote, furthermore to educate yourselves about issues and candidates so that you can cast an informed vote. How do we start our journey into the ecozoic era? The answer I sometimes give is extraordinarily simple, and that is to begin reaching out to others around us in real time, not virtual time, to purposefully create a network of support and ideas. Exactly what Dr. Pilgrim is doing today. She's bringing you human beings with good brains together in the same room to talk about ideas, to let imagination blossom so that you see each other in the eyes, you shake hands with each other, you get to know each other. Start with inviting your neighbors over for soup. Just start rebuilding community, as simple as that, together or alone if you have to. Make a list of the problems that bother you the most, and by nightfall today, start to do something positive about one of them. From this moment forward, I will do everything in my power, and my power is great, to see that each of my dollars and each of my words does the least hurt possible, that through my livelihood, as little, little is injured or abused or killed, not even the least of the wild species, and that through moderation, I slow the destruction of creation. If we can stay entertained enough with golf and video games and thousands of channels to choose from, distracted enough with malls and new products, scared enough of terrorists, and we might not stand up and revolt against a system that rips away from us in the core the things that really matter you, and replace those things with one that works, a system that works. And one way to revolt is not join it, to doggedly create a life that, that puts the sanctity of creation foremost. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said, human beings have other appetites besides money. 
and if we don't feed them we're not going to grow up so i believe we're going to have to fall in love with place again we're going to have to fall in love with each other we're going to have to learn to stay put more we're going to have to ignore that good ideas have been marginalized and rush them back to the center of attention we're going to have to love everybody are we preparing ourselves are you preparing yourself for the world ahead and that's where you come in, you people of imagination, uh, you thinkers, you who care, you who serve, you who can do so much good. So somebody went to Gandhi once and said, you know, in the middle of India's terrible oppressions, they said, our problems are big. We need big solutions. But Gandhi said a very interesting thing. He said, big problems need small solutions. Big problems need you doing what you love to do, but doing it with greater authority, greater love, greater knowledge, silencing all the voices of shame, letting that stuff drop, moving forward, knowing who you are. And let's be realistic. We need the training and the therapy that will help us work together without violence that will help us heal, assist us in ending cycles of isolation. And we need our religions to uphold life, quit supporting war, and teach peace. I know that many of these things I've talked about this morning run counter to um, this consumption-based system and oppression-based system that we're part of. But I think if we acknowledge that our actions are ruining life, not only for the future, but for ourselves, then we have to test our visions for a different world and our courage to produce it. Uh, the poet Brian Andreas wrote this lovely one-line poem, and he said, in my dream, the angel shrugged and said, if we fail this time, it will be a failure of imagination. And then she placed the world gently in the palm of my hand. If we fail this time, it will be a failure of the imagination. And she placed the world gently in the palm of my hand. Here's the world. We all lose much of what could have been ours because we don't pay much attention while we invent the future, said the writer Bill Kittredge. But today is a day for all of us to consider the rest of our lives, the rest of life, because you are the guys paying attention. You are the ones who can invent a different America, a different South Carolina, a different Spartanburg, a different university. It seems fitting, and this is the very end, that us, creatures of privilege, gifted beings, able to use language, to pass messages across geographies and generations should speak and act on behalf of those who cannot. Although the tasks before us seem monumental, as are our losses and our griefs, we have to find hope in our vision and hang on to it relentlessly because life is unendingly fascinating, unbearably beautiful, and utterly fragile. Thank you. How many of you would consider yourself uh, an environmentalist? Most of you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. I with your idea about saving as opposed to spending. Um, just can you expand on it a little bit? Uh, living within our means, maybe below our means? Yeah. And what to do with that excess? We, you know, we, pursuing our careers to, you know, advance professionally, but also to make more money. But does that automatically maybe increase our standard of living? And that seems to be our assumption. I mean, yeah. more I spend more to improve, bigger house, more car, fancy clothes, better meals. Yeah. What's, this oh gosh, well, it's a great question. So he, he just wants me to talk a little bit more about saving versus consuming, because he's saying that we have this model of an uphill line in this country that you want to enter the workplace making 20,000 a year and you want to leave it making, you know, 200,000 or 200 million. And the you also, you know, you want to invest 2,000 in the stock market and you want to you, you know, that's our model is this ever increasing line. And that that model only works 
if we're taking resources from the earth. And, and we know now that the earth is not going to support this model of more, 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 ever increasing more. I do think I think the more important model is really sort of like a, an uphill curvy line that we go a little bit in one way and then correct. And so we also use this same model for science. We think that there is no limit to what the human brain can figure out. But we are now actually being, we're, we're actually being stopped in our tracks by things that we cannot figure out. And, and so I, I don't actually think that the model of science uh, is an uphill line into infinity. I think, I think just a more true model is this meandering um, and, and hopefully progressing, you know, because sometimes it's going to look like you're going backwards, you know, that I return to a, a multi, a, multi, a polycultural farm, you know, a diverse farm, and that I would milk cows or, you know, train a mule. That seems like going backwards to me, but uh, in my life and and for what I want to accomplish, I'm actually moving forward, you know. Um, so the other thing that he said, and thank you very much, is that so even when we get to a place where we're making 60000 a year, we feel that we should increase our spending to match that. We should always be increasing our, our standard of living. But, but I think that, that there's a valid, a very valid point that's hidden in, in that um, question, which is, um, maybe we should renegotiate what, what quality of life means. That quality of life, you know, we ask our children for the sakes of their careers, their educations, their jobs, to go across the country, leave your homeland, leave your people, leave your family, leave everything you know and love to go to this far city and study or work. And I think we, in that way, devalue the things that we really love. And I think that without ridicule, we should be allowed in this country to live with the people we love and in the places we love, doing the work that's good and the work that we love. And, and so I'll just say this, that I, I think you have a great point, and I think that we should redefine what quality of life is. Quality of life is not the multiplicity of possessions. Actually, for me, quality of life is time, for me. And you had a question as well, right? Somebody back there, no? Anybody else? Yes. Either one, let me get the one behind you at a different table. Yes, you'd, yes. I was interested in your definition of like intellectualism. Yeah. And you were talking specifically about It's the sweet onion, it's the Vidalia Onion Festival. The Vidalia Onion Festival. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it sort of reminded me, so my family is, is not from America, my family is from Nigeria. Yeah. And the festival that you were describing sort of reminded me of something that perhaps would be a cultural event in, in our family's home country or whatever, um, to, which to an outsider you may not look intellectual. You may have a bunch of people wearing masks and dancing and um, chanting and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but just because books and like paintings and statues are not a big part of the festival does not mm -hmm. mean that it's not intellectual in some nature or serving some huge value to the culture. So I'm yeah. just wondering how you measure intellectualism in a culture that is not well exposed to the Western educational system right. or written language and things like that. Oh my gosh, that is so good. So did y'all hear? So she's from not her country of origin is Nigeria, where in a village in her country, there might be a festival like the Vidalia Onion Festival where people are dancing in masks and, you know, telling stories and they're not necessarily educated in the Western model of education. And so anyway, I stand absolutely corrected that you are, what a beautiful point that you've raised and thank you, which is, yes, we can have uh, so she wants to know my definition of what intellectualism is then. So I think we can have volumes of knowledge that don't come from books, most definitely. And I think hanging on to our cultures, as long as those cultures are not oppressive, you know, and not violent and not condoning um, things that really harm. I, I personally believe that property rights and human rights, the Bill of Rights should also come with an accompanying document, which is the Bill of Responsibilities. So your property rights are only as good to the point that you are not actually harming somebody else. 
So if you're dumping battery acid on your property that's flowing into another property, that is not property rights. So I, th I think just to keep it short, I'll just say that, that yes, there are ways of knowledge that don't have to do with Western, um, West, Western intellect. And I, a, a, in terms of intellectualism, I would count that. However, I think intellectualism implies the quest to know. And so when you are accepting on faith certain things that you've been taught without thinking about them, I think that is anti-intellectualism. And some, I, I think some of those are fine to hold on to if, they're, if they are cultural and they are upholding life. But I personally think that you have to, as a human, you have to ask yourself, does this uphold life or does this annihilate it? And even our most deeply held frames may fall apart. I know in my community, I love the culture of my community and I hate the culture of my community. My community is a really racist place. The, the immigrant workers who come in and pick, plant and pick the Vidalia onions are invisible people. I probably shouldn't say this on tape, but in my town, migrant workers get arrested for not having a green card they pay a $200 fine or 100 whatever it is. They're let go. A week or two later, they're rearrested. And they're invisible. They go out at night to shop. We don't have shopping places in my town. They go to a nearby town where they can slide into a Walmart or a Kroger or something. Thank you. We'll take one more, and then we, we're really going to have to get out of here. Yes, right here. I'm I, just, sorry. I just wanted you to just to provide some insight on on population growth because that tends to be one of the biggest challenges we have facing natural resources, but yet we don't tend to talk about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So when it comes to areas that we think are safe, whether it's federal properties, national wildlife refuges, or state properties, we tend to think of those areas here in 2018 as areas with boundaries that aren't changing, no one can go in there and do this, but as our population tends to increase, I think these areas are going to be confronted with a number of different challenges. So you mentioned population growth earlier. So the question is about population growth and population control and the things that, you know, like the wild places that we hold sacred now may not, he's, he's saying that they may not be uh, uh, exempt from people moving into them in times to come depending on on how many people we have but um so uh, population growth is something i know you know i i tip my hat to it i don't study it i try not to think about it very much and it it's i know it's just a problem that i for me is so huge it's a little overwhelming for me it yeah it very much is and I, and we see it happening you know we just see more and more people so all I, I, I really have been asked that question so many times that I stuck that line in there just so I could say, this will shut up the people who want to know more about population control. <laughs> but unfortunately, in this case, it didn't. <laughs> I'm going to leave that to you guys. I'm sorry to say it is a, it's a huge problem. It's one of the most, it's one of the largest problems when we're talking about environmental sustainability. Um, I always thought, though, in, in like the deep part, the deep recesses of my brain, I, I thought that population is, population grows as we artificially grow resources. And when resources begin to be scarcer, then population is going to automatically begin to reduce. Um, I want to thank Dr. Melissa Pilgrim for organizing such a marvelous day of, of speakers and workshops and to her staff, all her staff, especially Adrian Hayes, who took care of a lot of the details for me. Thanks to the University of South Carolina Upstate for um, hosting this program. And mostly again, I want to thank every one of you for being here today and for caring what happens to human civilization 
and the wild world and for believing in yourself. I, th I thank you. The final poem comes from the last page of Ecology and it's called There's a Miracle for You If You uh, Keep Holding On. I will rise from my grave with the hunger of wildcat, wings of kestrel, and with possession of my granddaughter's granddaughter to see what we've lost returned. My heart will be a cistern brimming with rainwater, drinkable rain. She will not know my name, though she bears the new forest about her, a forest so grand. She will have heard hooping cranes witnessing endless sky, while around her the forest I longed all my short life to see, winks and slips and shimmers and thumps, mutes and musks and lights. She will walk through it with the azure-bodied eagerness of damselfly. My child, I will try to call to her, my child, I have risen from the old cemetery buried in the forest where your people are laid where once a golf course began that was houses and fields long, long ago. She will be yet a child and may not hear me. Perhaps I will not speak at all, but follow her through a heraldry of longleaf, seeking for the course of a day the peace of pine warblers. And in the evening of that blessed day, I will lay to rest this implacable longing. There's a miracle for you if you keep holding on. Thank you.